What's up, Sina? What's up, Sina? What's up, Sina? What's up, Sina? Hey Mikey, what's up, man? What's um, up, coach? Dude, how are you? We're just trying to adjust everything here, the the volume levels, and uh, I can hear you clearly, uh, though. Yeah. Huh? Can you hear me? Good. Yeah, yeah, good, coach. I got my microphone here. Actually, it's my uh, girlfriend's phone. So yeah, my girlfriend's the one that helped me. <laughs> yeah, I was getting pissed. <laughs> they know best. They know best. <laughs> yeah, so she's like, you know, the thing is, I couldn't find my charger. I couldn't find my damn charger. And, you know, she's the one that she always seems to re reverse psychology me. So like, I'm over here, I'm about to explode. And then she's like, look, it, you know, she just put things back into perspective. And then lo and behold, the charger was right behind the laptop. And here I am I'm upstairs, downstairs, looking for the damn thing. I'm asking my, my 15 year old daughter, where, where's my uh, charger? All that stuff, man. So, so you have, do you have kids, Mikey? No, 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 no. Okay. Well, you know, how, how old are you, by the way? How old 30, are you? 30, 30, 30, coach. Oh my God. Hey, I will kill to be 30 again. <laughs> three kids, man. And, yeah. and you know, I love them all. And, but, but, uh, but. My, my, my son, man, the middle child, he's already like, he's already displaying like middle child syndrome. Yeah. You know? Like, like it's sort of like a, a, a battle to like not allow him to ever feel that. Um, but um, yeah, he was just running all around here at the same time. I'm trying to find my charger and um, you know, but I, hopefully he comes up here. Maybe I could just introduce him to you. Oh, for sure. Down, for sure. Here downstairs, he's playing yeah. with his, uh, his right now. So. So now, yeah. at least now we know what, what life is right now for the mountain. For Man, mountain. Yeah, it's, you know, my life is completely different um, now than it was, you know, um, yeah. I'd say about 10 years ago, 10 years ago. Yeah, at least, yeah. at least no more problems with Eric Mank, no problems with Dennis Espino. So now um, it's all the kids. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, um, dude, I, I tell you, uh, I tell people this, I forget that I sometimes forget that I played the PBA, you know? Um, and what I mean by that, it's no, cause I've been, I've been retired for such a long time yeah. and I'm doing so many other different things now that um, people are starting to identify me as this, oh, yeah. this, especially the younger generations, right? That's the best though. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then it's like, oh, he was a former PBA yeah. player. And then, so, you know, I always have to remind myself, you know, I, I did play at one point. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been quite the journey. Yeah. Retirement has been quite the journey. Guys, I'm with the mountain peak. Now we're going to talk about his PBA career. All right. Sure. Now actually I want to know the whole story. All right. Cause I'm going to okay. give him a chance to get back at Jared Dillinger. <laughs> <laughs> who sure. flat out said Ali Peak like hit him during his first practice. <laughs> I'm trying to guard Ren Ren. I'm, you know, I'm doing my thing. I'm just just happy to be here type stuff. Um, there's a couple sequences where I get a couple stops and whatnot, doing okay. And then uh, I had one drive to the bucket. Ali Peak just flattens me out on the floor, starts talking shit. Hey, welcome to welcome to the league, young fella. And I was just like, man, all right, here we go. All right, here, here comes the rookie stuff. I'm not even a rookie yet. Okay, first question, Coach. How was that story from your side of things? All right, well, well, first of all, that never happened. Uh, I think, I think uh, Jared was just trying to sensationalize the story. Um, why is, this, why is that uh, so like, hard like to believe, does, Coach? Like he does so many other, yeah. And, and you know, like, so all I remember, I, I remember seeing him for the first time. I remember reading about him in the paper. And then all of a sudden, one day, um, he shows up. And he's in his whole, he's in his Hawaii practice gear. <laughs> and he's just he's standing there um and i'm like hey who's that guy i go to jimmy i go who's that guy who's that cat and he go he go jimmy's like remember the dude from hawaii i'm like oh okay all right all right so um he practiced with us and that actually didn't happen the first day of practice he he practiced with us a few times and then i believe he was um put on a team i forgot back then there was a league I yeah, Liga, Liga Filipinas. Was it was it Liga Filipinas? Okay, so Liga Filipinas. He played for one of the teams I, I'm assuming belongs to the MVP group, yeah. so they can monitor him. And I had seen some games of his already, and um, I was I was very impressed. I was very impressed, and I was excited that he would be on our team. You're talking about a, a six foot four um, combo guard yeah. could possibly play the three. And you know what? This is where it gets interesting, <laughs> Mikey. Back then, 10, 11 years ago, was sort of like pre-dawn of positionless yeah. positions, right? 
So I wasn't even thinking in that context as far as JD was concerned. Nowadays, you'd be like, oh, this guy could play all four positions out there. Yeah. He could play the stretch four if he wanted to, you know what I mean, in the PBA. But I was just looking at him as a big guard, someone that could definitely help us out. Um, and then it was um, another – so he comes back. We have a practice game. We have a – I think it was a half court. We're practicing with this team. It wasn't a scrimmage. It was – we were playing half court sets, right, part of the drills – so he was on one team, I was on the other. And I think it was like three on three, three on three. See, he didn't even, he, see, that's the thing. That's the one thing with Jared. He doesn't go into detail, right? That's, that's, his, pro, that's his biggest problem. He doesn't go into detail. And it, it, not to mention, he has the, he has the worst um, sense of direction. There's the worst sense of direction. And here's what's so, so ironic about it. He was in the Air Force Academy before he, so thank God he ended up being a basketball player, right? Mikey, who gets lost? in his own village riding a skateboard <laughs> at nighttime. Like I, I can figure out where I'm at, right? That actually happened. So anyways, um, he has a clear path to the basket. He gets past his defender, goes straight up and I jump up and I block it. I didn't know. All ball, all ball. All ball, man. All it was ball. all ball. It was all ball. He falls on the ground. I, honestly, honestly, like, I'll tell you if I hit him. I'll tell you if I hit him, all right? <laughs> He falls on the ground. He slowly gets up. I never said anything to him. I'm not a trash talker. I don't tr I don't talk trash. I don't know. See, see, you know, like, I mean, let's get the story straight. Let's get the story straight. So, but that's what happened. That's what happened. That's the real story. That's so, real you, so you didn't say like, welcome to the league, Rook. I never said welcome to the league. I've never said that to anybody <laughs> ever, even on the opposing side. Like, to me, it just sounds so corny. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know, like, welcome. Why? No, I, I don't need to say that i yeah. feel like jd's gonna message me after after seeing this and be like let me get on yourself one more time <laughs> you just have to ask you know um you have to ask yourself who has better conviction and, and if you if you can answer that question right now who has better if you just i'll give you i'll give you a few you know you can think about it after our interview right if i have better conviction i'm telling the truth and i know i have better conviction that's that's bottom JD, line then so, jd huh <laughs> jd man he just it's drama man i'm telling you <laughs> drama that that TNT squad for like maybe five six years I think to this day one of the I, I always told JD if there was a 2K21 PBA 2K21 that that team would have been in the the classic teams kids would have played with that team for sure especially with all that talent um and you know you had like I think a good six seven year run thing uh let's see we we uh we won in 2009 you you were winning like yeah, yeah every, then... every championship. <laughs> yeah, we were, we, we, uh, I think we won in five years, we won for all Filipinos uh, in four, yeah. yeah. And we only, we only made, I mean, we made the finals in other conferences, but we only won one commissioner's cup. You know? That team was loaded. I mean, one of the more influential teams, actually, especially during that era. When I was in college, it was all TNT. But I would love to know, like, the whole story. All right. Where did sure. it start? Did you come out the womb like that? Like, Mountain Peak? <laughs> um, okay, was there so, ever a time that you were, like, scrawny and, like, slim? No. 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 I mean, you know, I, no, I, I, everyone says I was always a big kid. When I was born, I guess it was like nine pounds, six ounces, according to my mother. The origin is, um, you know, my biological father, and I've never met him before. He's African-American. Okay. And um, my mother's the Filipina. All five foot two of her so my biological father is six foot six i was a big guy and um you know i i guess he was he comes from a family of big people you know his um, according to my mom his brother was seven foot his mother was six foot three um my height yeah. so i'm about six three and a half like that's the real my real height but i guess that's it that's what explains the size yeah the you know? size. um but i'd always been a big kid it was one of those um you know every level in school i was always thought to be an older kid oh, yeah. so um you know i got picked on a lot i'm this big kid and everyone thought that you know I'm, i should be at a certain level academically but um you know my mind was still like you know i guess in kindergarten kindergarten or whatever you know um, preschool or um you know even when i got to grade school um but uh yeah so I fell in love with basketball at the age of 12. My favorite team is the Los Angeles Lakers. A lot of people know that. Um, I'm a diehard Laker fan ever since the 80s. And I guess you could say my mother um, and my uncles were the ones that introduced me to the Los Angeles Lakers. And back then, you're talking about the early 80s, right? I'm an 80s kid. So I used to watch um, the intro, the, the Laker pregame intro yeah. song. I remember the song like it's yesterday, uh, the music. And... Um, 
back then it was Norman Nixon, Magic Johnson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, um, uh, Mitch Kupchak at the yeah. four, and um, at the small forward, Jamal Wilkes. You know, that team, and then um, just, you know, of course, watching them throughout the 80s. And it wasn't until 1988 that I said, you know what, I want to be a professional basketball player. 12 going on 13. And, um, you know, when I talk to a lot of kids nowadays, um, and when I talk, like, when I'm asked to come and speak to people, one of the major topics that I'm asked to talk about is projection and um, also uh, law of attraction. And I didn't realize what I was doing back then. But when I learned about law of attraction, I didn't learn about law of attraction until 2014 when I retired. And I realized I've been doing this my entire life. So, uh, you know, those are the types of things that I talk about to um, a lot of these um, aspiring uh, young athletes. But uh, just to answer your question, yeah, you know, I that's when I fell in love with basketball. And all I remember is just being obsessed, obsessed uh, to the point that my grades actually suffered. And my parents got on my case about it um, because they knew that I was a lot smarter than that. But um, I, I, had, I knew it. I saw it. And that's what I explained to uh, people that I'm talking to is I, I saw it. I I saw myself, it wasn't the NBA, it wasn't a clear picture, but I saw myself putting on some sort of hat, putting on sort some sort of jacket or whatever, and you know, being selected by a professional team. Yeah. Right. And that's at 12. 13, I was already I was already practicing my autographs. Back then there was no you know social no, media. No, 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 no. no, no autograph. Yeah. Here, right? So yeah, I was practicing my autograph and I was showing my parents. My parents were like, you know, they, they don't, you know, they, they don't see it. All in this time from the age of 13 all the way up to about 17, I'm telling myself, okay, I have four years to to uh, make something of this basketball. I got to get a scholarship somewhere. My goal, Division One basketball. And I went to a high school, mind you, that was, it produces um, professional baseball players and professional football players. And so the NFL, we have I, have, I have a few classmates that played in the NFL. I have quite a few classmates, even teammates that played uh, professional baseball baseball as pitchers, you know, for the California Angels, I think the Chicago White Sox. So that was the type of school that it was. So here I am, you know, my dad even saying, you know, you mean to tell me out of all the thousands of kids nationwide, you think you can get a, a basketball scholarship? And I said, yeah, I looked him dead in the eye. I said, yeah, at 13. You know, I ended up playing in the NCAA and it was more of a learning process for me. I was very raw. There was a lot of things I just didn't know. And so I rode the bench, man. I rode the bench, Mikey. And um, it was very frustrating. And then um, my my fourth year, I had an injury. Uh, actually, before my fourth year, my last year, that, uh, you know, the coaches and I agreed that I'll just finish out my scholarship. I'll finish out my last year and I'll be done. You know, I'll be done. I mean, I was only averaging about three. This is the truth. I was only averaging about three points, four points a game in Division One basketball. But I guess in all that time, I was learning. And then, lucky enough, I get a call from my college coach. He said, I just got off the phone with your high school coach. We're going to get you an agent. And I said, well, wait a minute. You know, and my, my college coach and I didn't get along very well. I haven't spoken to him since 1997, 1997, all right? But I don't know what it is about him. He he helped me out. We had a tournament in 1994 in Taipei, Taiwan. St. Mary's College of California was invited to the, the, jo the R.W. Jones Cup. And at the time, the starting power forward, our starting power forward was doing time. He was doing time. Um, and... Uh, I got the job. I, you know, I came in, I started every, every once in a while in this tournament, you know, it's eight games straight, eight yeah. consecutive games. And somewhere down the line, I impressed my coach and he called me into the office and said, you have a shot at playing professional basketball overseas. You just need to stop being a knucklehead. You know? <laughs> yeah. So you know, he calls me into the office my senior year and just says, I want you to write these numbers down. Almost reluctantly, right? Because again, we didn't get along. And I said, well, wait a minute, coach, time out. You know, he goes, how's your knee? I go, well, he goes, get your knee in shape. And then he says, um, he says, call those numbers. All right. And, um, and then we'll talk again. And that's how the whole journey began. And the person that I spoke to was actually a guy by the name of Maury Hanks. And Maury Hanks at the time was, was a good, he was a good friend of my high school coach. And he was also... Um, the agent of Horace Grant, Horace and Harvey Grant. So he got guys to different parts of the globe yep. as imports. And he had connections to Filipino agents. 
So Filipino agents that look for imports. He gets me in touch with a man by the name of Bobby Rios. And Bobby Rios ends up becoming my agent. And um, a few months later, after I graduated, I'm in the PBL. Back then, it was called the PBL. So I spent the entire summer training my ass off, getting my knee back in shape. I was seeing a physical therapist. I mean, we were doing everything. And um, I got the call in October. Mm. As in, I flew in. I'd never been to the Philippines before, but my family was there. My mother's side of the family was there. My grandparents, I lived with my grandparents. Um, this is where I stayed, you know, at, at the, the ripe age of 21 years old for about, for an entire conference. And, you know, I, everything was just so new to me. But the good thing was, is I had family before I came here to the Philippines briefing me, you know, on the culture, how, how to really integrate. And I think that's another thing too. Part of the responsibility of a Phil, a Phil foreigner coming to play basketball in the Philippines or any country for that matter, you got to embrace the culture. Man. Oh, you have to sure. embrace the culture and it's your responsibility, your duty even to adapt and adjust, not the other way around. So I figured the quicker I can do that and understand that, hey, this is what you want to do. Okay, um, let's get to work. What was the adjustment though? Because when you entered the PBL, was there an adjustment uh, in terms of the game? Um, well, I was I was told I was told that it's physical. <laughs> PBL was, is I, physical. I was, I was told it was dirty. That's what I was told. Yeah. Like, yeah. and now you don't see that too often in the states, but I did experience that. I did experience that with American players. Um, I had quite a I had a few of them on my college team but um nothing on that level the good thing was this i think what's also important is i had i had really good people around me i played for ama computer college by the way ama um they were called i think we're called the cyber cyber masters or cyber yeah. tigers or something like that i had ed cordero in my corner and i just had good guys around me looking after my best interest the local players at one point mikey I, I'm, I'm telling you this i was the only american in the entire pbl at one point Whoa, at one really? point yeah. All locals. Yeah, all locals. And you got to understand, back then there was no limit, or at least I didn't think there was a limit because you had PBA veterans that retired. Yep. Playing in the PBA. Yep. You got, I'm going up against guys that are like in their mid to late 30s. And these guys come from the 80s. Yep. And you know how you know you know how rough it was in the 80s so this is what i experienced and i was always briefed i was told i remember ed cordero and a, a basketball player a teammate you know i wish i could get back in touch with him i don't know where he's at his name is um his name is alan Yu. and dude man he made he made my transition so easy um i wish i could find him you know yeah, to just yeah. thank him all over again because he was so gracious he was so kind man he, he just did a, a really good job in, in looking after me um but uh, um, they would always tell me, don't react, don't, don't react, react. Don't, react. Don't, play, don't react, don't react. And it's funny too, because I didn't know what they meant by that. Because the, the language was di- like the, the expression yeah. was different. Not don't react to what? And, you know, in the States, it's like, don't get pissed off. Don't get mad. Like, that's what they meant. So, um, you know, it was, it was just, hey, look, if you want to play in the PBA, if you want to, if you want a job, this is what you're going to have to go through. It's just, you're just going to have to go through it, you know? And I took a lot of hits, man. Like I figured, I, was, I thought no one's going to mess with me. I'm six four. Back then, I was 260 pounds. No one's gonna dare, right? But people, people tested me, man. They tested me, especially when we went out to Cebu. We played in a tournament out in Cebu, and this was my first glimpse and taste of the Cebu Coliseum and the fans. And um, you know, it was rough out there. It was rough. When did you start working out? Like, when did you start like taking it serious, as serious as you did? Oh, uh, from day one. From day one. Day one. So you felt so like I, that was your edge. This is. This is going to sound crazy, um, but for me, it was desperation. It was like, if I don't make this work, man, what am I going to do after this? You know, like that was my mindset back then. I got to make this work. There's like, I put it in my mind. I almost brainwashed myself and said, there's no other options. This, this is it. You have to make it. You got to figure out a way to make this work. And I got to tell you, um, back then, my knee wasn't necessarily 100%. But for some reason, um, in those three and a half months, my knee never gave me any problems. My left knee never gave me any problems. Uh, thank God for that, you know, because I was able to make an impression and um, I was able to get a job a year later. Well, you weren't really undersized back then. Um, I was because people kept, well, I felt that I was. I was, you know, I'm six, three and a half. And, you know, Daniel Defonso, they, they, they listed him at six, six. And I'm thinking to myself, he's really six, four. Come on. 
<laughs> he was six six. Okay. Um, you know, so I, I these guys, I'm standing around these guys and they're towering over like it just felt like they were towering over me. Back then it was, you know, you, you had guys like Eric Mink, you had who's a legit six six, by the way. Crazy about that is that's six six without his shoes. Okay. So really <laughs> six seven, you know. Who else was Dennis Espino? Dennis Espino. Dennis Espino. As a matter of fact, I say Dennis was my t- one of my toughest. Oh, Dennis, Dennis was cool. yeah, and a young Nelson Nasaitono. Now, Nelson oh. Nasaitono at 30, 31 years old was a son of a bitch, man. Like, I mean, there were times where I was like, man, I don't, I don't want to guard this guy because he's gonna embarrass you. Nelson and I, you know was... what? There, those guys that I just mentioned, right? Actually, I would say Dennis and um and and the bull. Those guys can play in today's game because of their skill set. Their versatility. Yep. Yeah, sure. You know, yep. absolutely. No question. And these guys, they're known for their, like, how the, how they're physical. But Dennis yeah. Espino is low-key a hooper. Dennis Espino was skillful. One of yes. the most skillful fours in the league. Yeah, And you know what? He was deceivingly athletic. And he was, when I say, like, people will say, was it Ossie was the strongest guy you played against? Or yeah. Eric. I'm like, no, nah, man. Dennis. Dennis Espino. Dennis was, he had that farm boy strength. I don't know where he came from. I don't know what province he came from, but he just had this, this like they were saying he doesn't work out. How in the hell does he not work out? He doesn't look like he worked no. out. Like he no, no. he was chilling. He, he was strong. Another guy that was like that was Bon Hawkins. Bon Hawkins. I mean, he didn't look like he lifted any weight. <laughs> You know, but he was just strong to the core. You know, some guys are just like that, you know, and it, and it fascinated me. It fascinated me. You knew that was your edge, though. Like, you knew that coming in, you were a, you, you always played center. You never really played four. Um, unless, unless maybe there was an import. There was, yeah, yeah. I did, I did play. Um, it was interchangeable. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, interchangeable. Yeah. So it was like you know, um, four or five. There was really no four out offense yet during this time. It was always just no, close. No, it was inside. Yeah, it was yeah. all inside. It was crazy. Yeah, you know, it's it was yeah you know, back then. I, now it's just, you're you're bringing back a lot of memories. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah but, that's how it was. Yeah. You were telling me that you thought no one was going to mess you with you in the PBL. Yes. In the PBA, though, who were the first guys who were wel- who welcomed you to the league? Nelson messed with me, but he didn't hit me. He kept grabbing the back of my jersey so I wouldn't sprint. You know, I wouldn't because I that was one of the things that they scouted me. I run the floor. I'll get about six to eight points just off of layups alone. And Nelson knew that. So he would make sure the referee wasn't looking and he'd grab my, my jersey. Yep. You no. Know? Now I never experienced anything like that. Never. Yeah, this you was know? this was the gulang, the gulang side of things. <laughs> yeah. Um, so dude, I mean, um, that was the first experience. The second experience was Jay Mendoza. And uh Jay Mendoza was sort of the enforcer of Shell. And I remember he comes into the game. I was having a very good first half. And uh, Vic Pablo was the one guarding me most of the time. And he was having a hard time. Um, every once in a while, it was Benji. But, you know, I've been studying these guys already. I've been studying them since uh, 1996, since my PBL game, my, my PBL days. And um, I was having success against them. And then in comes um, Jay Mendoza. And I'm running on offense out after a free throw. I'm running, I'm running on offense. I'm running down the side. He's backpedaling and he just takes a look over his shoulder to make sure no one was looking. And he's just, he just throws an elbow to my face. You know, all I kept thinking was I don't react. It didn't hurt that much. And I'm just like, I know what this guy's trying to do. He's trying to get under my skin. And you know what? Um, we we got in we got into a little scuffle, not a scuffle, but we got in got an interlock underneath, and he was trying to get the referee. It's like, oh look, look, you know. Yeah. But that yeah. was it. That was it. That never was it. after that, I never, you know. You were intimidating, yeah. man. You were intimidating. I, Come uh, on, was, man. You were two eighty. You just said you were yeah. two eighty. <laughs> you know, that first year, I realized how much work I had to do because I realized I wasn't as skilled as I thought I was. And the one thing about Filipino coaches is they will scout the hell out of you. They will study your tendencies and everything. So yeah, you know, that was, um, those were all the the, the intricate details. Um, and, of my first few years in the PBA. Yeah. And if you don't have counters, they know that you don't have counters. They know, they know they're they're going to load you somewhere and try to like put you yeah. on a spot yeah. like you're not used to. But I just want to know like how how disciplined were you? Because you were one of the hardest working guys in the league. Uh, like It's obvious. So how disciplined were you, especially during your prime? Well, um, I, I, I was pretty disciplined. I, 
I, uh, I would, you know, I was the type of guy that in my mind, if I felt it wasn't enough, then I, you know, it wasn't uncommon uh, for me to wake up in the middle of the night um, and go work out, you know. Uh, I mean, these were things that I would do, like, you know, even when I got into my, my, my late 20s, I was getting like, I was in Alaska at the time, and I think it was 2003 going on 2004. We're getting ready for the 2004 season, but this is just an example. Uh, before practice, I'd go swim laps before practice. You know, and I, you know, the thing was, I was a swimmer. I was a swimmer before I was a basketball player. I swam competitively. Um, matter of fact, I placed number two overall in Southern California in the breaststroke. In, the uh, in, a, in a relay, man. you know, so I, I was pretty good. Yeah, I was pretty good. But I used that as my um, part of my conditioning outside of weights. So that was what I would do. I would if I if my joints hurt that day or that week, I'd just get in the pool and swim laps. You so would wake what, up yeah, in yeah. the middle of the night to work out. Yeah, I mean, if I didn't have access to a gym, I mean, obviously things weren't open, but yeah. I would, uh, I would have. I would, I would just do push-ups. Like what I would do is I would um, I'd take a, a stack of cards, a stack of cards. And this is what me and my uh, my roommate in college used to do. He was a football player. He was a tailback. What we would do was we would split the deck in half and whatever card we'd pull over, um, if it was three diamonds or whatever, I'm not three hearts, we'd do three push-ups. And we just keep going until we're done with the entire deck. Any king, queens, ace, ace spades, whatever, that, that, that all equal 10. That was all 10. So we'd be, you know, like I would do that by the time I was done, I'd probably you'd get You'd be in. burning. Like you'd be- I'd be burning, yeah, <laughs> burning. And I, I mean, I used to do a hundred push-ups before games before you know? games yeah, yeah but you you always had your soft touch i mean you were you were one of the more intimidating yeah. like you knew that your <laughs> asset was really bang bodies down low but you always yeah. had a jumper you always had that soft hook i mean how would how did you mix like getting in the weight room making sure you were strong but at the same time, you were agile enough and skillful enough to score. I think that was something that developed when I was in high school. That was something that developed in high school. The first thing that really developed with me that I felt really comfortable with was the jump shot, turnaround jump shot in the post. Um, it's weird because when I got into the PBA, it was the hook shot. I don't know. Yep. Things just developed that way. Things just happen that way sometimes, right? Um, so I think the turnaround jump shot with someone in your face really, um, I guess, helped me get that soft touch around the basket, yeah. you know? And then when I was in high school, I my shooting percentage was around 60-something percent. And you would shoot a, like mid-range jumpers? Mid-range jumpers um, and turnaround jump shots in the post. Um, you know, back then, it was funny because now you see a lot of big men Actually, all the big men can put the ball on the floor. They can break their defender down from the wing. They can initiate the offense. They can knock down three-point shots. If I ever tried something like that <laughs> back then, no, I mean, this is this was the mentality. I, was, I have my Kumu channel, right? And I, I had Mo, Moala Tautua, the very versatile big. I had him, and we were talking. He's, you know, he's asking me questions also. And I said, you know, I don't know if you know this, Mo, but if I took a three-point shot back in the 90s, or if I tried to attack from the wing all the time, yeah. I would be labeled as soft. I, I was you. considered soft. The coach would be on my ass. The players on my side, players on the other side would be like, oh man, he's soft. He doesn't like the bang underneath the basket. Yeah. That was the mentality back then, you know? So it's crazy. It's crazy that way, how things just evolved, right? Yeah, yeah. it was, it was uh, but yeah, I think I think that's where the, the soft touch came. During those times, the perception was if you if you shot the ball from the outside, it's because you were scared of the inside. It's not because you were skillful from the outside. Yeah. It's just because yeah. you were scared of the inside. Uh, yeah, especially yeah. especially during an era, well, at least in the PBA, that toughness was you get paid to be tough. Yeah. Like yeah. a lot of players, in, I, I'm sorry to say this, but a lot of players in the PBA during that time were paid to be tough. Now yeah. it's kind of it's tougher. Now it's like, yeah. you got to be skillful. You got to know yeah. your role. Before it was just, man, if you can hit someone, you're going to get paid. <laughs> yeah. There were some guys in the league. I'm like, what in the hell is this guy doing? <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, is this, a, this guy I'm playing? Gonna, is I'm this not guy playing you. basketball or what? I, I, I can name three guys right now. I'm like, what in the hell? You know, like, you know, they average like three points a game. 
but they're like they're, they're getting PA veterans because you know they're they're sort of like that enforcer on a hockey team, right? Yeah. The guy can't the guy can't score. He can't even skate. Yeah. He's just there to lay people out, right? Yeah. You got yeah. three guys <laughs> at the top of your head. Damn. No, I'm not gonna. I'm not. Yeah. You know, like, I'm, I'm friends with these guys, and I don't. Yeah. You know, like, but you know, they they were those guys. They were those yeah. guys. Exactly. Yeah. That's why maybe if you shot a three, then you would be scared of these guys who are like waiting for you down low. But what's the first team you played for? Oh, my God.